as Christians, we're supposed to be alert. I mean, completely aware of all that's going on. Um, we're supposed to monitor things and make sure that we are on the right path. Uh, we're supposed to be spiritually minded. And with all of these things happening, why is it that so many Christians are just claiming the name but doing so many other things? We see so many that are being misled, so many that are just claiming things to be Christian when they're not uh, joining and participating in organizations that are not Christians and actually causing people to stumble. There's a lot of this that's going on. And and that question comes up, why is this happening? One of the biggest reasons why this is happening is because we're not consciously focusing on what's going on and taking everything and testing it. We're supposed to do that because as a Christian, we realize that it should be defined by God. Now, God has revealed that the only source of truth is him. That Christ is that source of truth. When he says in John 14, verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to me, comes to the Father except through me. What he's letting us know, okay, that it, 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 he is that answer. He's that path. He's that what we are. He is the answer. So why is it that when somebody provides us with a word or a definition of something, or they usually take the word, we'll take it with whatever definition we get. You see it done with love. You see it done with hate. You see it done with, oh, um, um, you know, of, of anything in the world that I'm supposed to use. And we're going to go over a bunch of them. I'm, I have a bunch of examples. I'm going to show you the two different definitions and show you how one which is of the worldly kind is so dangerous, and then the godly kind, which is supported by his word. Now, you may ask, okay, when did all this start? You know, why can't we just take a word and say we're doing it? Well, definition distortion, what I call it, started in the beginning by allowing God's answer to be questioned and distorted. Okay, we know the story in Genesis 3, 1 to 6. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Now you see how he first started. Did God? God really say? And this is what happens to most of us, because this is why we may be called lazy, because we don't put the effort to make sure. And then those who know it for sure, we still allow adjustments to be made because he first asked that and she had the direct answer for it. But then he gives, no, that's not going to happen. Look what he says, verse four, you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. And then he starts accusing God. Once again, we get caught up in the, do you think God really meant this? And he does it here in verse five. For God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So what he did there was made you question, even though you know what he said. And we all do it. I've heard Christians when I would clearly show them a verse that it said or a passage that the Bible says that we're supposed to do. And they'll make a comment. And I've heard ministers say this. Who does that? No one does that is what they'll say. And they'll be comfortable in that complacency of who does that. And that's us doing what Eve did here in verse six, when the woman saw that the fruit was good, for, uh, fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. In other words, in her mind, I don't see any problem with it. And that's when we go down the wrong path thinking we're doing the right thing. If you notice all the words she says, and there are positive words, still doing the wrong thing. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. That's exactly what happens to us, even when it comes to basic definitions. I'm going through a whole slew of list, list here because we can do it with every word out there. For every word, there is a counterfeit that is extremely dangerous. I'm going to first give you the counterfeit of each of these, okay? And I want you to think about that because you're going to see it's the standard that's used. And why are we as Christians using that same standard, which is wrong? Then I'm going to show you the godly one, which is based on that way, that, that truth, and the life. First one is wisdom. Now, wisdom, the worldly way of looking at wisdom, 
they'll say it is from experience and human assessment totally driven by sight. Now, some will look at this and go, well, no, I know it's from God, while you'll be following somebody that gives off this impression of being smart. There are some ministers, and I've heard people many times say, they're so smart. But if you pay close attention, their smarts come from some other form of teaching, some other doctrine, and they use a bunch of big words, and we follow them. It's totally driven by what this person in their brilliance came to the conclusion on, and we just follow them, and we call them wise. However, those who understand that it's crucial that this definition comes from God, and you're looking for true wisdom, we understand true wisdom is directly and only from revering God. In other words, you only get it, those you see fearing God. Those are going to be those who are wise. So you see it in their lives, first of all. And not them coming off uh, as being this brilliant person that, that, God, that God picked. It's going to be that person that you show fearing God. And you must understand, it does not work well with worldly wisdom. Because worldly wisdom based on the flesh, godly wisdom based on God. In the parentheses, you'll see uh, scriptures to back this up. I encourage you to look at the scriptures to make sure um, they're all in line with what's being said. If anything was missed, to cover this. And believe me, they're not always all the scripture. I couldn't fill up everything in there, but I gave it soundly to support what this is saying. Look at another definition, complacency. The world's way of looking at complacency. Now watch this, okay? When we do not strive to be all we can be, and more in the world, not excelling to always move up, not striving to do more, to enhance self, to keeping, not keeping busy no matter what. Now in the world, we have people, and this is called success, people who excel. I'm talking about I get to the highest level. Or when I get into a job, I want to keep moving up. I want to just get to the highest level of me. And we do what the world does. That's why we put people on pedestals, especially with the more they have and the more that they've done. And we give them all this credit. We do that, you know, right? And it puffs people up. And, 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 and some people will even give them an honorary Christianity pass because of what they've done. It becomes the me factor. I'm hoping you read your Bible enough to know when a person's boasting about self, when a person thinks they're depending on self, when a person thinks I did this, give me credit, how far away from God this person is. Jesus said we must deny ourselves. This is why true complacency, the most dangerous complacency, okay, is not growing in the Lord, not living in his ways and his will. It's all about God. In fact, and I want to be very careful with this, you're going to have some people that could have been in the world something much higher, but because of God, they chose to go this way. That person understands the true way of it. Because if they would have chose the something in the world instead of what God said, that would be complacency. Even though in the world, it looks like they're so successful. Many do it. There was a young man I went to school with. And he was out, he had a, a cannon for an arm. He could actually switch hands as he was playing football. And people would ask him, man, how come you didn't, you know, go to school, play football? He said, well, I got a scholarship, but I didn't take it. And, and his dad was very angry at him. And we asked him, why, why didn't you take it? And his response was, I want to go to seminary. So in his mind, I want to serve God. And I really want to do it knowing what I'm doing. If I went for the football thing, it would have to be about football. I'd have to focus on football. It was all about football. And then people would call it, they kept calling it a gift. And, I, and it's understood that it was a talent that he had. But he said, I just don't see me using this for God. So, and he went against his dad and all this. He went to, to serve God. That's a person that's not complacent. If he would have just went with what he had to be as successful in this temporary world, that's complacent. You see, reliant on man and on self, always striving for more on earth as primary, that's complacent. Not lessening self to enhance God. Remember, we're supposed to lessen. Sometimes he gives us a talent to see how much we will stop depending on self. Not looking out for others. Do you understand that? Right? When we're not truly looking out for others, but we're always trying to excel others. Do you understand this? That's complacency. The scripture, look it up. We have this word trust in which we use 
very dangerously because unfortunately the world's definition of trust is to trust those I love. Marriage must have trust in each other. Trust your children. Have people in your life you can trust. And most of all, just trust yourself. You ever heard people say, trust your gut, trust your feeling, trust this and that. And we use trust in that way with the most untrustful things. And that's everybody down here. It's the, by far the most untrustful things. Think about it. Now, if I have the trust in the right place, then all those other things will fall into that place. See, the Bible shows us true trust is in God only. In fact, Scripture tells us never trust anyone, including yourselves. It's saying people who trust in man are still under a curse. People who trust in self are a fool. Do you understand that? So we have this wrong trust. So I can't trust in other people and I can't trust in me. I just trust in God. Our relationship with others and self is through our trust in God. So it's not me trusting my wife. It's me trusting God as I live and love my wife and as I communicate with my wife. Does that make sense? Right. I won't put trust in her. I put trust in God in her as my wife. Trust will be doing what he says no matter what. My trust in God will be my peace of mind, not what happens with others. In other words, we already know in Romans 3 that all are evil. So when somebody hurts you and you see people that are crushed, I've seen people that are destroyed because they put a lot of trust in people. Instead of knowing, you know what, if this, when I start seeing a person that is supposed to be in my life moving away from God, that's when the alarm goes up. Do y'all get where I'm going with this? You don't just trust them because y'all knew each other since we were growing up and they're my friend or because they're my spouse. No, I see how their relationship with God is to know how much I can trust where they're at in God. It works in a way that just trusting in God. Hope is another thing. Down here in the world, when you hear people say they have hope, it's usually a focus on something we desire, a feeling. Um, feelings are dependent on getting what we wish. So it's more of a wish. It's more of a desire list, uh, an outcome um, that we hope happens. But the word hope for all Christians, as we understand it based on God's word, is I only have one hope. That is in Christ's return. That means everything else, I accept things that happen. I will have desires, but I'll accept when it doesn't work out the way I wished because my hope is in Christ. And this is why Christians then can count it pure joy when it goes through trials. Why? Because that trial, they understand, is part of Christ returning and me being part of that and how that works. But if it was just on my wish, it's on me what I feel and what I desire, even when it goes against what Christ is saying. Hope is built in us from God through trials. Christians know that. But if we don't, then we're being misled. And once again, it's because we didn't check, not because we didn't know. We didn't check. Compassion. I didn't realize how dangerous compassion was. And I've seen some people that are the minute they see somebody go through something, they're going to be that person's champion. That sounds great. In fact, that word compassion using the worldly definition is we react to people based on how we are emotionally moved by them. No matter what a person is going through, we accept their struggle for what it is and or how we see it completely based on God, on us. Now, I'm going to show you something because there was a, a conversation that came up and there's going to be bias in this conversation. Because the one person was talking about their child and the other person was talking about their child. The one person said, hey, my child was not included in this thing that was harmful. So I don't want them to be exposed to it and make them feel bad about themselves. So I'm protecting my child. Their compassion is I don't want my child to go through this trauma of what happened. The other person said, well, my child is being affected from what happened. So I think it needs to be brought up what happened, even though that child didn't do it, this child needs to make aware what really got us in the situation we're in. So who's right? The problem in this is both of them, their compassion is based on self, how I see it, how I want it. There's many people that's listening to this and you have that same compassion. There's a bias built up in you that you feel emotional, emotionally stronger towards than the other thing. 
but see true godly compassion, not human compassion, we must have godly mercy with everyone. We assess the entire situation and take into consideration everyone. Do you understand that? Okay, before we make that decision, we must effectively communicate. We are responsible for other Christians' burdens, but we must never enable. Sin is never acceptable. You understand that? And that's why like when people look at the homosexual community, in some cases they feel so bad for them, they just want them to accept their lifestyle. They want to say, oh, well, then we should just allow. No, that's me accepting sin in the name of compassion. We must help others in their needs. That means, and that doesn't mean we're mean to somebody if they're doing something that's wrong. We, this is, their compassion is going to show why we minister to them. It will be displayed in our actions. How we are to them will show if we're truly godly compassionate or not. Look at peace. It's a thing that we hear. People want peace on earth. We ask for certain things when it comes to peace. But do we really understand what true peace is? Do we know what comes in and what we get out of having, once again, true peace? Do we really have this? Now, as we look at it, um, the world's way is we surround ourselves with the right people. We strive for the most desirable situation in order for us to have peace. So we try to make people and situations right. Y'all get this. We try to make people and situations right. Right. And it comes back and it bites us for the simple fact because we make it based on situations and people, not based on God. See, it has to be based on God in order for it to work. So let's look at peace based on God. We receive peace from Christ. As long as I have Christ, I don't care who's around me or what I'm going through, I'm at peace. This is a person who's spiritually minded. And this is, and it is in spite of people and situations. It makes no sense how it comforts us in tough situations. In other words, we are going to have it. And like I said, transcends all understanding. Okay. People are going to go, I see what he's going through, but I see the peace he has. Christians lack this because we still lean upon the fleshly peace. I want my situation to be the best it can. I want the people around me to be the best I can. So sometimes we'll just ignore what the Bible says, what we're supposed to do, and we'll do what we feel is best for us. We have access to perfect peace by completely focusing on God all the time. Right? Perfect peace if your mind stays on me. How about strength? And once again, this is another one that you can watch. People are doing more of the worldly one. Watch how people choose to feel safe under, to feel strong under. Pay close attention to how and who people do this with. Do you understand that? Just watch real close how they do it. First of all, we continually exercise our bodies and minds to become stronger. The more I invest in me, the stronger I become. You'll see a person building self up. They talk a big game. They do stuff to look stronger, to be stronger. And I can tell you, people, more and more people will pick what the world calls a strong person to feel protected, to feel guided, to, to, to be led by. And many of these people are putting you in, in, a, in a huge amount of danger because you're following the wrong strength. Christians must understand we access true strength by weakening self. Now, am I saying you don't work out? No, I'm not saying that. Am I saying you don't study, make your mind strong? No, I'm not saying that. You do both of those things, understanding they're within the boundary of God. They are not my strength. They're within. The, so I do them to glorify God. I never do them because it's my strength. See, we recognize the value in fleshly exercise is less than spiritual exercise. There's some people, man, they won't let their workouts go or man, they're going to get their studying and then they'll read their book. When it comes to God, if I feel like, see the problem? You see, what God sees as strength is not what the world sees as strength. He says, uh, if you remember uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, my power is made perfect in weakness. But look at churches. They go out and they find the most worldly, powerful person. 
life, his education, his, his walk, his talk, and everything about it to lead. I want you to lead us because we chose the wrong way. And that's why they even had to tell Samuel, God had to say to Samuel, when you go out and look for this other leader that's going to replace Saul, don't look the way you guys will look. You know, check with me because you guys look on the outside. God looks at the heart. His brothers are probably much stronger and bigger than him, but they picked David from what God seen. Got to know true strength based on God. I met a lot of people that the world calls strong, and then I see people come to swoon over them, and they miss it. Because the people that aren't and don't fit that, you get God. Sincerity. It's another word that's used loosely. I've seen people not forgive based on this word. They didn't use uh, forgiveness in the way it's supposed to. In fact, sincerity based on the world, it is based on how I truly feel. I only do it when I am good with it. If I'm not feeling it, then it's not sincere. I've heard people foolishly say, give me some time to forgive you. I, I'll, I'll do what I can to forgive you. Now, why am I saying foolishly? Because the word is very clear. You do not forgive. You will not be forgiven. And this is why man had to rush around and create some other concept and say, well, what he really meant was this forgiveness versus this forgiveness, because this forgiveness is an act. It's work. No, 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 no. Don't get that mixed up. That's not what it says, because you distorted your concept of works and grace instead of just taking what the Bible says. Do you understand this? True sincerity is never based on me. I'll show you what that looks like. Let's read what godly sincerity is so we can get an understanding of how it's much different and more important to have this one. Our sincerity is totally based on God, never on us. We gain it by living in obedience to the word. Everything we do is because of God only. So what does this look like? So in other words, you do something to me. I feel so angry and hurt at what you did. And I'm trying to get over that hurt and that feeling before I can go, I forgive you. That's sincerity in me, which is putting me in danger because I could die before I finally kind of ask, uh, um, you know, accept or forgive. Godly forgiveness, I forgave you immediately. Do you understand that? Do I still feel the hurt and the frustration? Absolutely. But that's something I got to deal with. Mine is based on what God said, period. Why does he say love our enemies? Because it has absolutely nothing to do with, absolutely nothing to do with how I feel about it, everything to do with what God says. But when somebody says, I'm sincere in what I say, hopefully what they're saying is, I'm saying it because God said it. Doesn't matter what I feel. Please don't get caught up when somebody says they truly love you with my sincere heart. It's just a strong feeling that they are having. And next week, that can go away. However, when you can hear them say, I'm loving you because God says so. Do you understand? I know it doesn't sound as personal and as warm and as sincere. Please don't mix up that word. It's truly from God because I did it because of God. You see more marriages last. You see more children raised the way. You see more peak Christians doing the right thing if we were truly sincere. How about importance and valued? Like I said today, you have those people that will put other things ahead of God. It comes to their job, comes to their, you know, um, activities, their hobbies, um, their money, and things of that sort. What I call important. I might not even say it, but these are things that are going to always um, come front and center ahead of everything else. The world does it, and I hate to say it, Christians follow this more. We place value on things that mean the most to us. Watch how we are with our kids. When he gave that, if you love your mother or father more than me, you're not worthy of me. What he's giving to us and that understanding of, it, it, I have to be it. Going on, it says, my values are what I live for and what I treasure. Things that I value are what defines me. And the Bible even says that, do you understand, as a warning. See, the godly ones say, I value godly things only. I consciously do not value anything that is not heavenly. I will consciously devalue anything in my life in order that my soul value is in Christ. Now, why do I keep saying consciously, first of all? It's something you have to think about doing. You have to recognize you're doing, or you'll unconsciously not do it. There are many who think they're doing Christian things because they're not thinking. They're not stopping and going, so 
Is that what I'm doing? Once again, pay close attention to how people act with certain things, with their circumstances, how they are with their family, how they are with their money, how they are with their comfort. Go down the list and you'll see what they truly value. You'll see it because what's in line with God and what's not is a big, big difference. We can go deeper on a whole lot of these things. You understand? I'm just kind of giving you a surface so you can see how close, uh, um, how, how we're using the one and, and how we're supposed to be the other. We're going to do two more. Wealth. The more money, power, and access. So wealth doesn't just mean money. It means the control you have, you know what I mean? The access, the privilege you have, um, and, and all of that stuff provides more opportunity and admiration for others. We strive to get more wealth to be in the best position, even when it comes to serving God. So with some people even think, if I get to this position, then God, I can really serve you. They seriously think that. And this is why they'll strive for more money. This is why they'll step on other people to have more power. This is why we we want to be the ones that have more access. I know people haven't gone to Disney World, but there you have this pass, I guess, and when you can get on a ride uh, past all the other people that have to wait in line. I, people want that access. People want that privilege. You'd be lying if you didn't. But the danger that it does for us is this wealth starts defining us. This wealth makes us very self-centered which is not a godly attribute. The wealth from a Christian is when we recognize that any wealth here on earth is worldly. That's any wealth. And how we deal with it will dictate how much true wealth we will receive. You are with me? True wealth. You read that in Luke 16, where he tells that. He was like, how you are with this worldly wealth it's going to tell how you'll be with true wealth. Christians understand that those with less are actually in higher position than those with more. I always tell you, don't be jealous when you see somebody that looks like they're more advanced in this world, because the more I have, the less I am. And that means something. Please know it. Final one we're going to do is life. When you hear life usually described, and this is where I think people struggle, because I had an excellent question somebody asked me, and they said, you know, basically, I, I, I've been blessed in my life. They had their parents. Uh, they had their situations. They had money. They had their health. I can go down the list. Did they have some tragedies in their life? Of course, and people go through these things. So when they look around, and once again, they were having compassion about something. They were looking at other people. They were like, so... It's, why is God so unfair? Because shouldn't they have the, what I have in order for them to access and to pursue the things that I'm able to pursue? It's, why didn't God do that? Because maybe your definition of life is wrong. What the world has done with the definition of life is this. It says life is what you make of it. So we almost kind of blame people, and especially you hear the people that have stuff going for them and things kind of fall into place for them to fit their desires. Well, I did this, and they want the credit. It shows that we, we also say that everyone should live to have the best life possible. I know you may say, well, what's the matter with that? I'll explain. Live life to it to the fullest to get all you can before you die. Enjoyment, happiness, achieving goals, and desired relationships are evidence of a successful life. Now, reading that, I know everybody might go, yes, because that's what we want. And it's not wrong to want that. It's very wrong to think that. Because when I think that, just like that person thought, I now distorted the definition of life. That's not what God said. You can pursue this stuff. Many aren't going to have the opportunity to pursue it. Where they live, how they were born, situations that they're going to have to go through, either which way. Remember, he says, were you a slave when you were born? Don't let it trouble you. What were they supposed to do? Now understand, here's the godly definition. This temporary existence we have now is not the life we are to strive for. Don't get caught up in what you can have and making that the purpose. Don't do that. You can have achievements here as long as they don't get in the way in the true purpose. What is the true purpose? We are to use everything we get to help others and most importantly, to glorify God in order to strive for true life. Did you catch that? Catch that, all right? To have the true life, which is beyond anything we can comprehend, we must live this life 
glorifying God. We must understand some will be presented with desirable life circumstances and situations, while others will be presented with undesirable life circumstances and situations. Both have the same life goal. What is that? To obey and totally represent God. That's powerful. Now, everybody's fair. I don't care how bad my situation is, I still have what I need to glorify God. It just comes, it looks like it comes in, in, in different areas and different things you're going through. No matter what, God should be able to place you anywhere and you glorify him. That's our sole purpose. That's exactly why we're here. We are here. Remember he says, fear God, keep his commandments. That's a major part of us glorifying him, displaying him, showing that we trust and know him. So putting all this together, in order for us to do this, let's think of three things that we have to do in this. First of all, we have to completely trust in God and never in self. Completely trust in God and never in self. And this will keep us uh, from following ungodly definitions. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7, when it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not <clears throat> on your own understanding. This is, is exactly how it sounds. Go to his word to get the answer and do it. I can assure you this is what are people doing. Somebody asked me something about something being spiritual one time. And after I was showing them, yeah, you know it's spiritual because the Bible says this. But they were so frustrated to their understanding of, but I like this better. It was like totally ignored. I'm not doing this thing because even though it's the right thing to do, I'm going to keep doing this thing because I'm more comfortable. They allowed their understanding of I'm more comfortable to get in the way. And this is what happened to Christians all day. We won't grow because we're not doing this. He says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. I, you look around, you have Christians trying to make their life what it should be. Pastor, what's the matter with that? Did you just read what I just said? In all your ways, acknowledge him. So I live my life acknowledging him. Hi, God, how do you want me to do this? How do you want me to do that? How do you, in me doing that, he makes my path straight. He already gave me the answer. So why are you trying to do what he said he'll do? Because you don't trust in him? He says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. When he says, do not be wise in your own eyes, it's because we keep making assessments on our own and then making a move. And this is why we don't know when it's Christian and when it's not. See, when I fear the Lord, that means I'm checking with him and I'm doing exactly what he says. Second thing we need to do is corrupt definitions exist in our lives simply because we allow it. So plain and simple, we must stop allowing it. That's a big part of it. We can't keep allowing it. I think it's killing us because we're allowing it. So what do we do? Excellent question when it comes into how do we not allow it? First of all, we see in 2 Corinthians 11, 3-4, but I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. He was saying these people in Corinth, first of all, had a godly, which is sincere, sincerity, and pure, that means they 100% follow God, but they're saying there was still this problem of deception. And that deception comes in because we allow it. He says in verse 4, he shows if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached. Have you ever watched somebody and they, you know, they get somebody that's an excellent speaker, they say the right things, they make you laugh, you enjoy it. Next thing you know, you have people, hey, you really need to listen to this. You know how many times I got one of those? And when I got past the entertainment of it, the, 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 the feel good of it, all that other stuff of it, I would say, do you know all the stuff they're missing? Did you really go through that? He says, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, the Bible tells us to test spirits or a different gospel from the one you accept. The Bible clearly gives us what the gospel is, what the, what the good news is. He says, you put up with it easily enough. Christians are not urgent, not diligent in dealing with these things. That's a major problem. The final thing we must do must check everything. First Thessalonians 5, 21 through 22 says, test everything. And then there's going to be two groups. He says, hold on to the good and avoid every kind of evil. I could do this with every word, everything we do in which we see, are you doing the right way? 
right definition or are you following uh, the wrong definition? And, and, and it would surprise you if we stop for a minute and look at the things that we're doing, how we're doing it, it would blow your mind on a lot of stuff that we in ourselves sincerely think we're doing right. God, we'd look and say, wow, I never even checked. Make sure everything in your life and including your life is truly only defined by God. Let us pray. Dear most heavenly, most gracious Father, thank you so much, dear Lord, for this opportunity. Thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your warnings and just providing us what we need in order to receive and to apply and to live in a way that glorifies you in all ways, dear Lord. We want to know in, in everything that we do that we diligently and reverently look into things to make sure it's in line with what your word says and that we're representing you in the way that you would have us to do it. Help us to walk in such a way that we're ministering to people with our lives by truly following you and not not in a wishy-washy way where we just accept what we hear from others in the world as being the truth without us checking it. Thank you for your love, for your patience, for your mercy, and for your grace and all these blessings we ask in your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ's name, we say, Amen.